Good afternoon, everybody. It's me, your boy, Matt. How's everybody doing today? Great. Amazing. Well, it's been a few weeks into the summer vacation here. If you are on the school year calendar, whether you be in a uh, secondary or post-secondary or academic setting of some sort. And I thought I would, now that we've all had a few weeks to rest and recuperate and uh, get all the bad memories out of our system about learning, I figured I would provide some educational content for you. A big question that a lot of students have, no matter what age level they are, whether they've been secondary or college or postgraduate, is what to read, of course, right? And of course, one of the biggest areas is philosophy and political philosophy. So I figured that I would give a a brief rundown of what I think are the basic seminal texts for, for philosophy and especially political philosophy, since that's my area of expertise. Well, area of interest, we will say. Uh, so I like to go, I like to proceed in a more or less chronological order, order. I think that's the best way to do it because you can think of this as being a sort of a conversation, right? And if you can't, understand the, the previous link in the chain, it's unlikely you'll be able to understand the following link, right? So uh, let's dive right into this and take a look at this. So I have a little list here and you can see it's it's not that long. So, but it is, it, it will take you quite a long time to read it. So don't worry about that, right? So I like to start at the, in the classical period, right? With the uh, Greek and Latin writers of course, the first ones would be the Greek writers, right? So we have our first three major authors, uh, Plato, Aristotle, and then we have another guy who doesn't quite fit. Plato and Aristotle, of course, are Greek, and Cicero, later on, he's a Latin, a Roman, you might say. And so why did I put him in here? Well, I think Plato and Aristotle are the place you should start to, to study philosophy. Unfortunately, Plato and Aristotle are some of the most difficult people to fully understand, right? They, uh, they actually aren't that difficult to start, but they are that they are very difficult to uh, approach as a whole, right? So I've kind of thrown Cicero in here as a bit of an experiment because Cicero was a later writer, right? He wrote centuries after Plato and Aristotle. But he had read Plato and Aristotle, and he incorporates their ideas into his writings, right? So you can think of Cicero uh, and those writings of his as sort of being almost cliff notes or, you know, almost simplified versions, summaries of Plato and especially of Aristotle. So if you want to be enterprising, if you want to be uh, experimental, why not give Cicero a try? Uh, he has very approachable, uh, very clear writings, right? Plato is tricky. He's going to give you a story. You're going to have to dig through it. You're going to have to figure out a lot of it yourself. Cicero, he kind of lays everything out there for you, right? So I have a couple of texts of Cicero. Uh, De Legibus, which means on laws. Uh, De Republica, which means the public things, which obviously is where we get Republic from, and De Ofikis, which is about uh, duties and stuff like that. Uh, so if you want to try Cicero out, he they're pretty short. Unfortunately, most of these texts are fragments. We don't have the whole thing, but we do have a good amount. But De Legibus, De Republica, De Ofiki, De Ofiki, Ofikis, <laughs> uh, not very long, and they're pretty clear. They're pretty approachable. So I, I kind of recommend that you start there if you want to kind of dip your toes in the water. But of course, if we wanted to start off chronologically, we would of course start off with Plato, right? Now, there's also this other guy named Socrates. Maybe you've heard of him. And you can't really separate Plato and Socrates, unfortunately. But for our purposes, and for most purposes, Socrates, we don't treat him as a philosopher. 
we treat him as a character. He is a literary character because he really didn't write anything of his own. I don't think, believe there's a single existing work of Socrates. He exists in the works of other people. He exists in Plato, he exists in Xenophon, and he exists in uh, Aristophanes, and probably some other people too, but those are the, the main ones. Uh, so we have the Symposium, which is probably the easiest text to approach Plato, I think. Uh, and interestingly, there are actually two symposiums. Uh, there is Plato's version, and then there's Xenophon's version. Xenophon's a pretty cool guy, but and I recommend you read him as well, but he doesn't really fit in this political philosophy beginner's course, I'd say. He's a little bit later on in the more advanced stuff. So the symposium is about, it's about a party, really. That's what a symposium is. And uh, Plato, well, Socrates, really, it gets hijacked uh, by a couple of guys to say, hey, you're coming with us. And they drag him and his friend to a party, basically. And they, they discuss lots of different things. They discuss, uh, you know, what, uh, what beauty is and all sorts of things like that. In the typical Platonic style, right? I can't remember every single thing that they talk about in all of these <laughs> dialogues. So forgive me if I got that one wrong. The one I always remember about symposi the symposium is how the father, who's old, is talking about how glad he is that he's old and not young because he doesn't have to deal with all the appetites of life like, like lust. And everyone's just looking at him going like, uh, we didn't ask you about that. But anyway, it's pretty funny. Another fun thing about the symposium uh, is that there's a character in there named Adiamentus. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And I think Adiamentus is Plato's older brother. So that's pretty funny. Uh, so Plato writes in these dialogues. They're basically stories, right? Where most of the things that's going on is people are just talking. They're having conversations, right? There's no real plot. There's no real action. It's just a group of people having a discussion. And uh, Plato doesn't show up in these. Socrates is the main character who, who occurs in all of these. So it's funny to think of Plato as sort of this background character because he never shows up, but he includes people like Adiamentus, who's Plato's older brother, and, and other people that we know are Plato's friends. So we know Plato is there. But he doesn't show up in his own writings, right? Uh, so Symposium, I definitely would recommend as being the first thing to read. And it will also give you a great introduction. Now, the Republic, the most important Platonic text, right? Everyone knows what the Republic is about. It's about how should we best organize a society, right? And uh, it's, a, it's a real mouthful. It's a big book. It's a big book by normal standards. Uh, and, you know, it took me about three or four times reading The Republic before I, I truly understood it myself. So I would recommend reading it, but don't come to too many conclusions by yourself, right? Uh, a big problem with Plato is that he, he engages in these sort of rhetorical techniques, right? So one big thing is Socratic irony. Right, where Socrates says he doesn't know what's good or what's bad, but then he goes on and explains exactly. <laughs> and then he just sort of trounces everybody and beats everybody into submission with it, into submission with his logic, right? We don't know well, nothing in the, the in the dialogues is meant to be taken purely literally, I guess you could say. I hate to bring up the same argument that's used in biblical studies, but he's he's not telling you anything, right? He is he is putting forth the things that you should be thinking about, right? So I would recommend read read the Republic and then kind of let it sit and mellow out in your mind and maybe every couple of years read it again. See if you get anywhere with that, right? And then we have two other smaller texts. Uh, we have Gorgias, or Gorgias, as it's often called. And Gorgias is an interesting text because it's about a guy 
guess what his name is? It's Gorgias. And Gorgias is uh, what was known as a sophist, which, which was a, a tutor, right? It was basically a, a wise teacher. Soph, sophos means wisdom in Greek, right? And the sophists were wise guys. And uh, Socrates and Plato's opinion of the sophists was not very high. He thought that they were, well, Plato thought they were tricky and that uh, their wisdom was more like cleverness, right? It wasn't really wisdom. It was tricks. And so Gorgias, that he kind of takes him through the, through the ringer in Gorgias. And it talks about a lot of knowledge, right? What, what is knowledge? Uh, how do we really know it's true? And that sort of thing, right? And then, of course, finally, we have one of the most famous uh, court cases of all time, uh, the Apology of Socrates, which de details uh, Plato's version of the trial of Socrates, right? Because Socrates was tried for uh, basically being a pain in the butt, <laughs> and he was forced to uh, imbibe poison, and then he died, right? Uh, and there's a lot of different things going around there, right? Uh, for one thing, Socrates probably could have gotten out of it if he had not been such a pain in the butt, right? And Plato goes over the reasons why, right? He says, oh, I'd, if I did this or that, then uh, I wouldn't be being true to myself, right? In fact, there's this hilarious part where it's, uh, Socrates has already been condemned as guilty, but now he has to give a short speech as to what he thinks his punishment should be. And Socrates sa says that his punishment should be basically that they hold a parade in his honor, right? And you can imagine, you can imagine how the jury felt about that. They were probably a little bit ticked off by that, right? All right, so that's Plato. Now there's a whole lot more of Plato. This is not even half of Plato, although it might be half of the total pages because the Republic is a, is a doozy. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of little ones. But I think th this is a, a good starting point, right? The other ones are going to be a little bit more complicated, a little bit more obscure, and they're not going to be, they're not going to come up as often. I think these four, though, are a good solid foundation, right? Now, I think that you should start chronologically. However, if you wait until you're an expert on Plato before you move on, you're going to be an old man before you move on from Plato, right? Or an old woman. So, you know, try to get a good amount done, move on to something else, and then come back to Plato, right? Ditto with Aristotle. Now, I've read a good amount of Aristotle. I can't claim to understand Aristotle. I feel like I can I can kind of explain Plato, but or I can at least tell you what the question is in Plato. However, in Aristotle, who knows? Right? Actually, I think he's just a lot more straightforward Aristotle is. So, maybe it just doesn't stick in my mind as well, right? But I recommend you read these uh, three books, The Nicomachean Ethics, The Metaphysics and Politics. Aristotle was much more kind of precise and analytical. So everything is very, very clearly indicated, right? He's very organized. So I don't even need to explain what these things are. The ethics is about ethics. Uh, metaphysics is about metaphysics and politics is about politics, right? So uh, Aristotle may have been one of the first people who tried to categorize all of life. So, you know, people make fun of him sometimes because he, he was really one of the first real scientists, but being one of the real first scientists, he said a lot of things that were not very true, right? They turned out to not be true, but I don't think that's any reason to, you know, disparage him because he was, he set out to basically categorize everything in life, like his ethics, metaphysics, politics, and he also studied physics and rhetoric and poetry, right? And mathematics, right? He tried to grab the entire universe and put them in his philosophy. 
right? So, I mean, the Platonists, they, they studied mathematics as well, but Plato doesn't really spend a lot of time talking about mathematics. Whereas Aristotle, well, Aristotle was kind of a Platonic person himself too, right? So, okay, so that is the classical period, right? Now, is there anybody else in the classical period? Where there's a few other people, but they don't have tons of extant, meaning existing work, right? So Pythagoras, right? We certainly have secondhand accounts of Pythagoras, but we don't have too much of actual, you know, Pythagoras didn't write too much down, right? So if you can find these things, especially, you know, in museums or academic journals and such, then great. But I, I can't really say there's a whole lot more in the classical period that we can look at. Moving on to late antiquity and medieval. Now, I have a couple of books here, two, Livy and Plutarch. Uh, they were both living during the Roman era, I believe. Uh, Plutarch was Greek, though, and Livy was obviously Roman. And we're going to read them, and they're great. They're both kind of historians, and they're both great reads. I really recommend them just purely on that. Uh, but we're not reading them just because of their great history, but we're going to later use their histories as uh, fodder, so to speak, for our political, philo political philosophical discussion, right? So Plutarch was a really, has a really interesting book called Plutarch's Lives, right? And he will go through the lives of, I believe it's 12 very important people, right? So, like, he'll tell you the life of, uh, you know, Alexander the Great. I can't remember off the top of my head, right? But Or uh, the lives of uh, uh, Numa, the, the lawgiver, right? So, very important... Uh, and very interesting uh, historical information, right? How much of it is necessarily 100% true? Well, we have to study more about that, right? And same thing with Livy, right? Livy does, obviously, he's more about the, the uh, Roman than the Greek, but same thing. Now, we also have St. Uh, Augustine, right? Who is actually more philosophical with theolo theology, right? And also theological. So we have City of God, which is discussing the relationship of uh, the city of, you know, how do we orient our society, uh, taking into account the fact that we do live on earth, but we're also trying to orient our city and society towards the holy, right? Towards heaven, right? And then we have Confessions, which is a little bit more personal, but also has some really interesting philosophical things in it as well. A really interesting part of Confessions is the ending, because he kind of throws in, as an appendix, reflections on time. And in Reflections on Time, he basically details a basic theory of relativity. He says, hey, how do we know what time is? Well, we measure time by the movement of things, right? So if there is no movement, how is it that we can measure time, right? So he's, he's using this because they're discussing, like, when God created the earth in seven days, what does it mean by seven days, right? Presumably, when God was creating everything, there wasn't a sun yet. There wasn't a solar system. There wasn't the earth yet. So what does a day mean? And of course, St. Augustine says, well, it, it probably doesn't mean what we think it means, right? Or likewise, you know, when the, uh, when the forerunners lived for a thousand years, right? Or, or you know, when uh, Methuselah lived for 800 years, I think. Well, what does that mean, right? So that's pretty interesting. I think it, we didn't come up with everything. Right. OK, so I think that's a great beginning. Right. That kind of covers our pre-modern authors. Right. And I'm leaving out a ton of people, guys. I'm leaving out so much. But I'm just trying to give you 
you know, <laughs> a year's worth of reading gear, basically. That's that's how much this is, right? It would probably take you a, how long would it take you to read all of this, right? At least a year, right? I think. But moving on into the Enlightenment, right? So uh, when we talk about the Enlightenment and uh, modernity, we always talk about two guys as being the founders, right? Well, three guys, if you want to include Mill, but especially in political philosophy or in, in general, right? I guess Stuart Mill would be more specifically political philosophy. But in general, for philosophy, we have Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Now, Hobbes comes for first, and we should probably talk about him first, right? So his most in, two most important books are De Kiwe, which is on society, right? And then Leviathan which is the famous book where he details the Leviathan of the state controls everything, right? Uh, the one thing I want to talk to you about in Thomas Hobbes, though, is especially in these two books, he comes off as an incredibly dull person. Uh, I really don't like him, especially in Dikiwe, because he just goes off and <sighs> explains why he's an anti-authoritarian, anti-authority person, I guess. Uh, he clearly has issues with authority, <laughs> and then, but then for some reason he loves authority. Uh, isn't that funny how that works? But Thomas Hobbes is a little bit of a weirdo in other stories, so don't judge him just by these two books. He's a super weird person, he and he deserves to be treated like a super weird person, in my opinion. Right? Uh, the other funny thing about Thomas Hobbes is it, our, us modern people today, every time we see somebody who is a little bit heterodox, like is a little bit weird in their religious beliefs, we want to jump on that like there's some sort of proto-crypto atheist or something, right? And I don't think that's always true. In fact, I think a lot of times it's not true, right? I think when you have a, a uniformly religious culture, well, hopefully, uh, presumably, then I think that gives people more freedom to kind of express their different weirdness, right? Their different strange ideas and beliefs, right? They're, they kind of have more leeway to let their freak flag fly. And I think that's what Thomas Hobbes is doing. And you see that weirdness in some of his other uh, writings. Unfortunately, you're not really going to get it in De Kiwe or Leviathan. Uh, and somebody who's not weird... Somebody who's pretty much uh, take them as they come is Mr. John Locke, right? Luckily, he has much shorter works, right? He's got his Letter Concerning Toleration, which is a seminal classic that kind of lays out our modern view of toleration. And then he has two treatises of government, right? So uh, this is really where the meat and potatoes of modern liberalism is coming from. So if you've looked at my other videos about what is liberalism. I think I have at least two so far. This is where all of that's coming from. Mr. John Locke himself, right? So highly recommended reading. If you read any two stories, any two books in this list uh, for the purpose of modern, dis of modern discourse, then read these two, right? Then we have Mr. John Stuart Mill, who is incredibly boring, but I think his On Liberty is important to understanding he sort of takes the John Locke uh, foundations of liberalism, and he kind of explains how we get there, right? I, I said in another, in another video that there's a real link between Locke and Mill, because Locke is explaining uh, a theory of toleration, and then John Stuart Mill is saying, okay, now that we have this theory, how is it that we're supposed to decide anything? Where do our values come from? And he largely decides that it should be based on this practical and ultimately materialistic vision of not causing harm, whatever that means, right? And now my personal favorite on the list, well, personal favorite that's uh, uniquely my favorite, is Montesquieu, uh, The Spirit of the Laws, right? So I'm actually coming up with a video that will be next about the spirit of the laws. So stay tuned for that. I think the spirit of the laws is a great book. It's a little bit more um, niche or niche, as some people like to say. Uh, 
I guess we should say niche since Montesquieu was French or Swiss. Which one is he? I don't remember. And uh, it's really good, not just for the content, but it's, it's great for, as I say, arranging the furniture of your mind, right? If you read The Spirit of the Laws, it will actually help you think better, right? And more effectively, right? So I highly recommend, highly recommend that book. And then, of course, we have Sir Jerkwad himself, Machiavelli. And this is why I asked you to read Livy, Ab Urbe Quindite. Is that the title? Yeah, there we are, Ab Urbe Quindite. Uh, because the Discourses on Livy is a really, really, really good book. A really, really good, well, treatise. Where he goes through and, and uh, makes a theory of history, really. Right, and we can compare, can compare Machiavelli's history theory of history with Aristotle's theory of history. And Machiavelli says in the Discourses that we kind of follow a cycle. I'm sure you've heard that expression. You know, uh, hard men, uh, hard times create hard men. Hard men create good times. Good times create soft men. Soft men create hard times, right? And that's basically, basically what Machiavelli says. He says, if we go in this dance, right? We, we, uh, we ha usually start off with a tyranny, right? Some sort of monarchy. And then when we have the monarchy, uh, we then, people then want to seize power from that monarchy. And, and, uh, but then once they have the power, then things start going to heck again. And then people want a strong hand to come in again and take control. So we kind of go in a circle, right? Between a, era, a monarchy, aristocracy, democracy, etc. Right? Not very uh, complementary to democracy, I would have to say. And then sort of moving into the more modern age, finally, uh, we have Mr. Rousseau, Mr. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, and his two stories, Emile and The Discourse on Inequality. Now, The Discourse on Inequality is a more typical essay, whereas Emile is kind of a, a little story he makes about a little boy named Emile, and he uh, talks about how a child should best be raised up, right? And uh, that's uh, where he puts in his ideas about you know, the state of nature, right? They talk about the state of nature in a lot of these uh, these stories. Oh, John Locke, you know, talks about, oh, when, when we were just out there, cavemen were just hitting each other on the head with the clubs. There was no law. There was no social contract. But now we have a social contract. Uh, Rousseau talks about the same thing, except Rousseau actually thinks that the state of nature was probably better. You know, we didn't start oppressing each other until we started creating societies. So that's an interesting comparison. Okay. And then for all of our American friends, we have uh, the Federalist essays, right? So these are, if you will remember your, <laughs> what was it? 11th grade, right? Our 11th grade U.S. history courses, the Federalist papers were a series of pamphlets that were put out by uh, our founding fathers, I believe Thomas Jefferson being the foremost one. And they were basically trying to convince people that they should uh, ratify the Constitution. They should support the Constitution. And there were a bunch of them, but these are the most important ones. And if I can show you, I just want to show you 85, right? That's the one that kind of get cut off, cut off there. They're not very long, but as you can see, there are a whole bunch of them. And then one of my other favorite books, Edmund Burke, Reflections on the Revolution in France, right? And Burke is considered to be the father of conservatism, right? Where he talks about why we should be conservative in our political principles. Not, not conservative in the sense of social conservative, but politically conservative as in proceed slowly, create natural uh, institutions, allow them to grow. Because he's looking at the revolution in France, and all these people wanted to create utopia right now, and they destroyed their monarchy, and basically what happened is they they ruined their country. And quite frankly, 
it's only been quite recently <laughs> that France has not been a total disaster, right? They pretty much have been a disaster. They have had a new government like every 30 years, right? Since the revolution, right? So there's something, something went really very wrong there uh, that didn't go wrong in the American revolution, right? The, which, which many people say wasn't a revolution, right? The American revolution got rid of, you know, British sovereignty, uh, but it didn't destroy the country, right? It didn't upturn the whole order, right? And so Edmund Burke is talking about that. He's saying, look, they've just, they've ripped the whole tree out in France. And I always say that uh, it's also very, it's a funny book if you listen to the tone, because he's really ripping them apart. He is merciless, right? He, he is a sass master, as I like to say. Okay, uh, and finally, I'll just give you a couple of medium, medium advanced books if you happen to have already read a bunch of these, right? Um, I won't go through all of them in great detail, but uh, here's a few more for you, right? So from the late antiquity medieval period, we have Thomas Aquinas, and also we have Boethius. Uh, Boethius uh, is going to be pretty simple, but Thomas Aquinas is not simple at all. He is a very complex guy. And then we have a couple of people uh, who uh, I, I recommend that you should at least glance over them, but you don't necessarily have to go over them in, in great deal detail, right? So uh, Averroes and Al Farabi are both uh, Muslim thinkers, or I guess uh, hmm, where were they from anyway? I want to say Averroes was from North Africa, and I'll say Al Farabi was from. Mm, Saudi Arabia area area so basically Islamic thinkers right part of the Islamic uh, world there and then Maimonides was a Jewish thinker uh, I believe from Spain right so all very important for the time I can't say that their uh, influence has been that long lasting but they're certainly worth looking at in terms of different perspectives right we often talk about how Aristotle was adapted into uh, Christianity by Thomas Aquinas, and you can compare that to how uh, Averroes attempted to adapt Aristotle himself, right? Then we have Spinoza, who was a, well, he was Jewish, but I think at some point they kicked him out. <laughs> and he's a funny character. He's a real funny character. Uh, he's a little tricky. I think he read Plato and he got really he got really interested in being tricky with his audience, right? And then also we have Sidney and Harrington. And Sidney and Harrington are interesting because they are contemporaries of John Locke and they kind of give opposing viewpoints, I guess you'd say, right? Uh, so take a look at them. See who you agree with. Do Sidney and Harrington have good uh, opposing arguments to Locke. And what do you think about those? Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that little quick trot down the historical philosophical lane there. Exciting times here on the channel because I'm, maybe I should have put this at the beginning. I'm coming up with the what is wrong with communism video. And I think that's thunder outside. I don't know if you can hear that. What is wrong with communism? But before I do that, I need to go over Montesquieu's spirit of the laws, because that will be very important for us understanding communism, liberalism, etc. Right. So stay tuned. I should be coming out with a new video shortly. If you'd like to support the channel, visit my Amazon page. Take a look at my uh, very cheap <laughs> and price, not in quality book, Mr. Snuffles. And I will see you guys later. Y'all have a good day now, you hear?